κύριες και κύριοι σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την να, να, να μιλήσω για τα εργαστήρια για τα πρόντσινα χαϊκίνα και σύγχρος δεν ξέρω καλά ελληνικά πρέπει να μιλήσω αγγλικά Until the time of the Second World War, our knowledge of the manufacturing technology of Greek large-scale bronzes resulted in the superficial examination of preserved bronze statues, for example, the charioteer of Gelfi. Uh, the next, please. But the answer is okay. The starting point was not uh, the rough examination, though. Instead, more encastic methods were resorted to. Um, Kurt Kluge's book, The Ancient, uh, the Antike Erdgestaltung und ihre technische Grundlage, Ancient Bronze Casting, published in 1927, became the main source of information. Even though he could not draw upon any findings of workshops and Kluge's observation on original artworks were contradictory. The first remains of a workshop from ancient bronze casting with significant findings came to light, to light during excavations of the American school in the area of the Athenian Agora. At the foot of the Colonos Agoraios, below the temple of Hephaestus, a pit was discovered which was filled with numerous fragments of burnt clay. Traces of bronze and discoloration showed that those were the remains of a smashed casting mold, which was used for a cast in the lost wax process. After stabilizing and gluing the fragments, it was possible to reconstruct a less than life-size kuros, which must have been cast around 530 BC. It is one of the earliest hollow casts that we know. The next, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, further conclusions concerning the technology could not uh, be made from the archaeological record, however. The so called archaic foundry thus got less attention than it deserved. This changed years later. Due to a row of coincidences and contemporary phenomena. Uh, the next, please. Uh, The impulse to engage in the studies of well-known large-scale bronzes came from the outside in the 70s of the last century. <clears throat> Numerous bronze artworks that had been on display in the open air suffered damage from air pollution and had to be brought indoors. At the same time, of course, they were roughly examined including metal analysis, analysis according to the latest methods and removal of the damage. The four horses looted from Constantinople by the Venetians in 1204 that adorned the facade of San Marco for centuries are the most popular example. They have been replaced with copies while the original found their place in, uh, in an inside room behind the gallery. The, the next step on the way to study the ancient Greek casting technology was taken once more due to a time-dependent coincidence. The growing popularity of diving as a sport within the scope of a summertime a swimming pleasure on the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea led a young man at the beach of Riace Marina to the discovery of two life-size bronze statues. Uh, the next, yeah. <clears throat> they were nearly unrecognizable at first, but after recovery of the Office of Antiquities in charge and the following restoration, they changed, uh, they changed our image of Greek statues from classical time substantially. At the beginning of the 70s, 
the laboratory of Florence were the best equipped ones. They had been established there in the 60s to repair the immense damage the flooding of the river Arno had done, especially on the bronzes of the archaeological museum. The staff there had a long experience in the analysis of bronzes. The two on the, um, at the work of the two warriors from Riace brought to, f uh, to light a technical perfection and of a closeness to nature unknown until then for statues from the 5th century BC. Uh, the next. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, the next, please. <laughs> the composition. Yeah, <clears throat> And and the next is the composition of several parts above all had previously been seen as a peculiarity of Roman Bronx casting technology. Here, the examination of warrior A done by Edilberto Formili has removed all doubts that we are dealing with artworks from the fifth century before. In recent past, both warriors were recast Prince and Brinkmann, which gives, gives us a prospect, prospect of what they might have looked like originally. The next. At this state of knowledge, the workshop at the Temple of Apollo Padroos got into the focus once more. At Homer Thompson's suggestion, Carol Matusch edited the workshop and you within the scope of her philosophy philosophic degree. However, with numerous new finds from different times in the area of the Agora. She discovered that mold fragments for the casting of two different heads existed, which is very important. It points to a cast in individual parts and thus to the existence of a developed welding technology in the last quarter of the 6th century BC. Uh, the next is uh, at first, yeah, uh, the, the two heads. Uh, uh, the next, please. At first, it was believed that the cult image uh, for the temple of Apollo Padroos had been cast here, but not for the preserve building from the fourth century BC. Now it turned out that the temple did have a possessor and the um, abscess, building, uh, abscess building from the 6th century BC, but was under the, um, from the 4th century, was not a, a sacred building. With that, the way was clear for seeing the abscess building as a workshop like the ones found several times in the dawn of Greece. So we have a complete workshop from the end of the 6th century BC, but we neither know where the mold was fired and the wax was molten out, nor where the bronze was molten. Uh, you see on the right side the uh, um, houses from Ischia in Italy, and I remember also uh, that in Eret Eretria is an abscess house uh, from a goldsmith. Next, please. An observation made at Rhodes helped us here. In 1975, two parallel lengthwise oval pits were discovered there. On the parcel Milonas Nasu during the preparation for a construction of a large building. The excavation had to be done on a tight schedule, so only one pit was uncovered. <clears throat> the findings consisted of slag, Wrong fragment, burned clay, and charcoal. The evidence for a workshop for statuary bronze casting was clear. Since no expertise was available at short notice, the excavation was abandoned and stayed available for later examination in a big room that was only disturbed by the concrete pillars of the house. The work was taken up in 1987 and 1988 by Charis Kanzia. 
I was doing research on Greek Bronx casting workshops at the Berlin Antiquen Museum since 1980 and was able to participate in the excavation. It was a bit difficult in the room under the house. Uh, we all uh, were, uh, were a bit sick. <laughs> the next piece. The cleaning of the uh, bigger pit showed that the casters had cast another larger than life statue here. The pit had originally been completely isolated with mud bricks, the casting mold being installed in the middle. The actual firing room was closed, closed off by walls on both ends of the pits. Allowing ideal, high, ideal heating conditions, the wax that was flowing out during the heating was led through the earth channel underneath the parti partitioning wall and collected in a small pit. When the foam has heated completely, it was quickly surrounded by sand to uh, resist the pressure of the Bronx flowing in. The Bronx itself was poured into the mold using crucibles and funnels. <clears throat> this technology was discovered at the end of the fourth century before C, and from there on was state of art in the big uh, Bronx casting workshops until Hellenistic time. We do not know what kind of statue was cast here since only few mold fragments have been preserved. Our knowledge of workshops by Stadtwery Bronx casting for Stadtwery Bronx casting had expanded considerably in the last years due to a chance find. When the metro was built in Athens, employees of the third Ephoria uncovered workshop structures, including a row of big casting pits underneath the Leophoros Amalias in front of the parliament in Athens. The area is uh, directly next to the Syntagma Square, where previous excavations had already explored smaller remnants of Bronx findings. After the excavation had ended, a part of the installation was transported in a complex operation and relocated at an open-air exhibition ground in front of the new university in Athens. The excavation is documented there in a small museum that can also be used for didactic purposes, as is the rule no many, no many a tourist will visit this instructive place. The next. The scientific research of the publication of, um, of this finding is in a worse way, unfortunately. Basically, there are only a few pictures and texts in the volume The City Beneath the City that was released on the occasion uh, of the exhibition of the same title in the Benaki Museum. The remains of the workshop on the edge of Syntagma Square nowadays lie nearly the center of the city, while during the time the Bronx casters worked there, in the second half of the 5th century BC, this area was in front of the city wall and mainly used by uh, readers uh, for uh, supply of processing water. The delivering of heating material and clay was not a problem either, and for the phases of intense smoke emission, the position was in con was convenient as well, since the west wind drove the smoke away from the city. It is no wonder that here, for the first time, we find a big Bronx casting workshop, which did not only carry out a short-term task, but covered the demand for statues for decades during high and classical and late classical time. As usual, remains of such workshops, with their many uh, conversions, are hard to interpret. A look at the situation at the excavations back then, back, <laughs> back then mostly shows, back then mostly shows different pits which are concentrated around a kind of courtyard. The situation becomes comprehensible only when we see the dating of the excavators included in the plan. It becomes clear that just the pits two and three 
belong to the core inventory of the workshops from the 5th century BC that was located inside a courtyard is with the green color. This was lit as at least the way by an open wall and uh, threaded down uh, threaded down uh, clay with traces of fire, ashes, and charcoal marks the floor as a workshop ambience. Unfortunately, later installations and walls uh, disturbed that feature. Only one of the pits, the, the next thing, is conspicuous. There's a depth of over two meters beginning from the work surface. Uh, it was built to construct and fire molds for larger than life sta size, sized statues and fill them with liquid bronze in the end. Unlike uh, the pits known, known up to then, the entrance of the actual firing chamber is spanned by a small stone bridge under which the workers had to pass when they climbed down into the pit. This construction is only explicable if one makes a point of maintaining the best transport routes possible within the workshop. At the same time, it made it easier to use the pits for several consecutive casting or statues of, uh, of roughly the same size because it was easier to build and to spot a wall when beginning with the firing. So here, for the first time, we have a pit construction that was fit for the operation of a stationary workshop. Next, mud bricks that could be used as an isolating material or for building a retaining wall had even been prepared in a side room and leaned against the wall there. Next, among the numerous fragments of the a smashed mold, there were uh, pieces that obviously depicted garment folds, so it was safe to assume that one of the last pieces, ca pieces cast here had been a female statue. In one of the last boxes, there was a fragment of a mold for casting a finger, which surely belonged to a life-size statue, as well as an imprint of a mouth. The separate mold for the mouth matches the technology used in the 5th century BC. From the statue A of Riace, we learned that lips were sometimes cast from poor copper to make them more life lifelike. The mouth from the excavation is quite small and it fits statues like the Athena Lemnia well. It is also clear, though, that one lip is not enough to identify the types of a statue, even more so if we only know copies of it. The amount of fragments of funnels and pipes among the findings from the Syntagma Square is surprisingly high. They served for pouring in the bronze and letting out the air. In most of the fragments, two or three uh, vent pipes Pipes were connected. <clears throat> the next thing. Um, big funnels sometimes show very complicated air ducts on their inside, which testify to a technology that mastered the setting of gates perfectly. The huge number of funnel fragments of different forms and sizes is another hint that the workshop at the Syntagma Platz was not a temporary uh, site, but the permanent house of a Bronx caster. The finding described, as well as some others, allowed us to reconstruct the Bronx steps, uh, the, the uh, reconstructed process steps in a workshop for statuary Bronx casting, theoretically, but only theoretically. So, to make sure that this works in reality, we ran an experiment in cooperation with the Foundry Institute in Aachen and Edilberto Formili in Murlo, which intended to test the functionality of our thoughts. The pit in Rhodes was our model. The construction of the pit and the lining with handmade mud bricks 
created a heating room, heating room in which the statue of the praying boy was built as a wax model. The supply and deduction pipes were added in wax according to the examples of recovered mold fragments and the examination of the surface of, uh, of the original statue of the praying boy in the Berlin, the uh, Berlin Antique Museum. Um, uh, this happened without any difficulties, difficulties, just as did the setting of the mold in three differently tempered layers. After the phase of frying, the mold was fired hard and the pouring uh, of a crucible full of liquid bronze into the mold shows that the gating system worked. The next, yeah. it was not possible uh, to melt a large amount of liquid bronze in Murlo. A praying boy that was cast after the same pattern in Aachen showed that the modern mold fragments are identical with, to the fragments from the excavations in regard of looks and texture. Uh, yeah. The next, please. Thus, the correctness of our interpretation <clears throat> of the findings was assured. With this newfound uh, knowledge about the casting technology in, in Athens, we are now able to solve a cold case, as the forensic scientists would say, as a, you find a murderer after 50 years <laughs> about. As early as 1878, pits were uncovered in the southern slope of the Acropolis in Athens, whose contacts went to the work of a bronze casting workshop. In spite of a follow-up excavation by Nicolaus Platon in 1963, the situation remained mostly unclear. Only through new excavations by Evgenia Kazapoglu in the years after 2001, a newly discovered pit proved with certainty that this was a workshop where the Athena Bromachos of Phidias had been built. I do not want to show all the details in that case if we will submit it. But uh, to understand it, I asked an, an drawer in an Eichstätt um, to give us an impression of the uh, steps of the technology. Um, however, we want to follow the development of the Athena Broma horse from the installation of the workshop until the assembly of the monumental statue on the Acropolis and uh, depict the single steps through the drawings of the artist Rupert Fieger from Eichstätt. Those drawings for which many details had to be discussed brought new insights too. They always required a duality between the observation of the findings and the reality of the craft. Uh, since the workshops um, was workshop was active in the years between about 460 and 450 BC, um, we have to regard the historic reality. In 480 BC, the Athenians had given up their city when fighting the vastly superior Persian army. Army they evacuated the population to Troezen and put all their hope in the, fees, in the fleet, which then defeated the Persian fleet at the Battle of Samis. Upon return, the Athenians found the city completely destroyed. On the Acropolis, only the walls of the old temple of Athena were still standing, secured provisorily, and used for the cult of the city goddess. Though the citizens immediately started rebuilding their houses, the city walls and the public buildings. In the time around 460 BC, a huge amount of houses remained destroyed. Accordingly, the transport material for the workshop moved through a destroyed city. Despite, a, a just, despite or just because of that, the Athenians decided to keep their sanctuaries in ruins 
to remind everybody of the sacrilege committed by the Persians and to only consecrate a nine meter high statue, statue of Athena paid by the Persians spoils. This was decided at an assembly of the citizen and the Athenian entrusted the sculptor Phidias with the execution. At the same time, the ecclesis, Ecclesia voted for a committee which was in charge of the finances. Those Athenian citizens called Epistates had to check the progress of the work, pay the virtue, to pay the wages and provide the raw material such as copper, tin and silver on demand. It was the first duty of the Epistates to provide a workspace for Master Phidias, which fulfilled his requirements. The administration of the sanctuary offered a large space on the terrace at the southern slope of the Acropolis. At the beginning, the place had to be cleaned, um, be, be cleared from the stones that had fallen there during the destruction of the limiting wall by the Persians. Afterwards, the workshop floor was dressed to form a horizontal surface. The steep rock, the steep rock of the Acropolis was smoothed as well to make it possible to build protection roofs for the workers. When all this had happened, the installation of the foundry were built according to the measurement Phidias gave. Since the colossal statue had to be cast in parts, the head of the single castings was, uh, was fixed from the beginnings. The master ordered three pits oriented north to south. Each of them was a duck three meter and 50 centimeter deep, deep, that is 12 attic feet about, measured from the work workshop floor. To make work inside possible, steps were cut into the soft rock from both sides. Two more pits were added for smaller castings. He also ordered three legged levers, three legged levers above the car large pits. Smaller buildings had to be erected to protect the workers as well as the clay models from the sun and the rain. The steep walls of the Acropolis rock were ideal for simple wooden constructions. At least one building had to be more massive to secure the more valuable raw material like silver and tin and to protect them from thieves. All the work was done by the city of Athens or the administration of the sanctuary, which is why they are not um, mentioned in the accounting of the epistates. We have to assume, though, that the installation of the work area um, was time-consuming and surely took a complete year, I would say. Only when the workplace had been prepared so far, probably in the spring of the following year, work began for specialized employees of the workshop who were partly free men, partly slaves. The work area became a workshop in the true sense of the word. Uh, the next, uh, yeah, again. Uh, all the raw and work material had to be transported to the work area, of course. This probably happened with beasts of burden, for the most part mainly by donkeys. Thus, the residents always had reason to marvel when, the, when, when yet another column of donkey drivers passed their houses, heavy loads were moved uh, surely with carts. Okay. First, the side walls of the casting pits were uh, cased with air-dried mud bricks. In the middle of the floor of the pit, a base of workstone blocks was built. Uh, the surrounding floor was uh, let out with mud bricks and clay was spread in the gap between the bricks. The pits were insulated with a modern open fireplace, like a modern open fireplace to allow for ideal heating conditions. The bricks were standard, standardized 
squares with a side length of about one cubit, it's 40 centimeter. To set the bricks and the damp clay, some extra workers were hired, and this time the work site was very busy. Because of the large dimensions of the casting mold, the core could not be filled with clay only. That would have put too much pressure on the wax model. The stabilize the mold, the workers build a core and worked stone blocks and worked stone blocks. The employees in the workshop of Fidias were divided, I think, into two groups due to their specialization. Part of them were responsible for building the models and casting molds and everything else connected in the question of aesthetic, aesthetic property. Translation to modern concepts, this was or the, translated to modern concepts, this was the molding shop. The other group were the casters. They had to make sure that the transformation of the draft into the material of bronze was executed as perfectly as possible. And all of the advantages of the material were exploit exploited. Above the two departments, but also embedded into them, we have the image in Master Fidias, who was responsible for the design, together with one of or two assistants. The proximity of the departments stimulated discussions about the best solution for every detail. Therefore, while the casters worked in the, on preparing the casting pits for the building and firing the molds, the molding shop was extremely busy. A model in original size had to be built after the example of the small model. The only material available was clay. It was applied in differently tempered lay layers and stabilized with inlet red reed, with, with reed, a practice known in modern um, history for the construction of plastered ceilings. Of course, it was not possible to build a nine meter high statue with this method, which would have been inept for the further steps as well. Instead, the statue was divided into three parts castings, the three part castings, which were built under a protective roof next to each other. The core was built with roughly tempered clay and stabilized with reed. A thinner layer followed, and the last layer consisted of fine clay, which showed all the details. Uh, the big models could not be exposed to direct sun sunlight, of course. Um, this is uh, why the work had uh, to be done in an open hall made of wood whose front could be closed with sails on demand. It was very, um, yeah, it, yeah, it was, yeah, it was different, yeah. Uh, in the meanwhile, in the meantime, uh, the formers in the second hall were busy preparing the wax. Beeswax, wax, which was delivered in huge amounts, had to be treated before it could be used for building the mold. To improve the optical impression, fame, uh, ferrous ex oxide, fer ferrous oxide was worked in, which can be detected in the fragments of the molds that were found. Thus, the surface became, became blunter and the plastic effects of details could be assessed more easily. The low melting point of the beeswax posed another problem. Beeswax is deformed easily in the heat, especially in direct sunlight. If you have a half an hour uh, direct sunlight, um, the wax will flow, out, flow away. There were tricks to harden the wax, like the example, the addition of colophonium. Colophonium was known in antiquity, but it cannot be verified archaeologically in any case. The addition of such substances was a workshop tradition which was kept secret and constituted the capability of business. Um, when all parts of the big model were finished and all details finally evened, it was dried in the air. Small cracks that occurred were filled with uh, clay. 
Now it was time to take a wax mold form from the one-to-one -one models and to assemble it in the pit. The workers did not have alone uh, silicone models at disposal like today, but merely tempered clay. The choice of the material brought the problem that undercut parts could not be molded directly, so some of them were cut off and formed separately. All, all in all, this was a time consuming operating process, including several phases of, uh, <clears throat> of drying. The work began with the application of a separating layer, which prevented the wet clay from sticking to the model. Afterwards, a layer of finely graded clay was applied, and afterwards a more um, heavily tempered uh, one, which together with the reed um, brought stability until the clay was dried. It was fixed to the model with a rope. <laughs> Once the oxyl, uh, it could be because the the parts were so uh, big, they used also for the transport uh, some wooden construction. We we are not sure. Uh, once the wax mold was constructed in the in the pit and the clay of the core filled in, the supply pipes and drains made of <clears throat> of wax had to be applied with the funnels for filling and the liquid prongs on top. During the, all those works in connection to the construction of the form, the direct slide had to be avoided, or the wax could melt quickly and all the work be in vain. This was especially true for the site of the workshop at the southern slope of the Acropolis, where high temperature can occur as late as October. The direct sunlight was dangerous not only for handling the wax, the wet clay developed cracks if it dried too fast, especially <clears throat> the layers of finely graded clay. To prevent that clay danger, the casters used the three-legged levers above the pits. If one leg was facing directly south, sails spent uh, there could block the sun coming from southeast or during sunset southwest. At the same time, some cool air was allowed in from the open north side. Uh, the next, uh, under the protection of the sails, the casting mold. Okay, uh, the casting mold was built now. The first layer of finely graded clay was um, uh, was with hair uh, followed with was tempered with hair and kneadable uh, hair and well kneadable. The hair had another benefit. It burned. Uh, it burned when the form was fired, and the air could escape uh, through the resulting small channels. The distance holders were pushed into this layer and connected the outer layer with the core material. They prevented the core um, from shifting when the wax was molten out. In our workshop, they were made of iron. A third layer of clay with fine split and straw uh, ensured the stability. It was applied by hand, which is why oft, why often shows fingerprints, maybe also the fingerprint of Phidias. The succession of the layers and their tempering was crucial for the uh, success of the cast. Uh, thus, the mixture of clay was were an important trade secret. Therefore, the tempering for the layers was added in the workshop itself. The workshop of Phidias was treating well-known path into that point, yet the colors colossal size of the cast asked for new considerations and technical solutions as well uh, as we as the pressure of the most layers of the core on the wax and the casting molds was enormous despite the stone ashlars in the center uh, the mold were reinforced with horizontal iron bands on the outside which was fastened with vertical 
vertical aligned uh, iron bands. While the huge molds in the pits were slowly drying, the workers um, erected walls of mud bricks to the north and the south of the molds and thus created an evenly wide heating room around the molds for the success of the work, even more so with the new technique with the iron bands, the heat had to be equal on all sides of the mold. At least in one pit, there was an opening in the wall to the north to regulate the air supply in the heating room. When all this work was done, the farmers made way for the casters. When the casters taking charge of the work, a livelier, a livelier livelier first began in the workshop. It is, um, if it had not happened before, more fuel in form of charcoal and firewood was delivered. Columns of donkeys were needed and they trekked to the southern uh, city up to the workshop area from several directions. Yeah. In the last phases, the form was heated uh, with a charcoal fire until the wax began to melt. This was easily discernible when the wax in the upper funnel opening sank slightly. The following step were difficult and risky for the workers. They had to remove the plug, uh, the plugs as so though the wax could flow, flow out from the intended opening. It was collected in vessels and removed from the firing, fired area. Otherwise, there would have been the danger of the wax inflaming and uncontrollably and deflagrating. If is, it is hard to tell how that was done for the huge molds. Probably the blazing charcoal was pushed aside since the residual heat of the mold was enough to keep the wax liquid. Maybe an opening in the wall was used to pull out the charcoal. In any case, it was a risky undertaking due to the amount of wax flowing out. Afterwards, the actual heating and firing of the mold began, which took several days and nights. Firewood was stacked all around the mold, lighted and stoked repeatedly. The mold was completely fired when no vapor rose from the funnels and air vents anymore. Uh, the next is, in the meantime, another part of the casters, together with numerous day laborers, had begun to prepare the crucibles um, for melting the metal. The clay crucibles were set into flat, preheated depressions that, that were filled with charcoal. Three bellows were arranged around each crucible. A foreman had to put the weight, weighted copper that was chopped into pieces, roughly the same size into the crucible and heap it with charcoal before the workers began to fool the fire with their bellows made of animal skin. Only after the copper had molten, an amount of tin was added that had been weighed by the foreman as well to reach the same <clears throat> alloy in every crucible. Uh, the next is... After approximately one or uh, two hours, the workers subtracted the liquid slack and uh, thrust rods through the armoring of the crucibles and transported all of the crucibles one after the other to the funnels of the mold. In the next, the installation of three equally sized pits in the center of our workshop suggests that they were used shortly after each other. While the molten metal in one pit was cooling, the form in the second pit was fired. In the end, at the third, east mowers one followed. After the huge molds had cooled, they were smashed. The raw casts were pulled out of the pits using the three-legged levers and led on a basis where the supply and deduction pipes were removed with saw and, and sizzle. The core holders were sawed off and hammered out with a punch as well. This next, the next, the following so-called cold, cold work took years in which the farmers and the casters 
work together in small groups. The following, um, for the first uh, uh, part, cars had to be soldered together. The diesel supply and deduction pipes were available as raw material because they were the same alloy and thus had the same color. Afterwards, the statue was put up on the stone basis near uh, to the western pit. This basis had the same size as the final lineup and was oriented, oriented in the same way as uh, in the same way. So the effect of the light during the day and during the year could always be uh, taken into account in the construction. For the further work, the statue was surrounded by a scaffolding. For the cast of arms, faces, and feet, silver was added to the alloy to give a lighter color to the parts of the statue representing skin. Uh, thus, the image of God is reminded of the statues inside the temples, which indicated white skin uh, by the use of ivory. Some of those works, work steps took place in the wooden buildings, and all of them spread over a long time. The details were discussed repeatedly on the scaffolding. For the public, uh, there was not much to be seen now, as was intended. Um, maybe sales were put up again as well if the um, curious onlookers on the Acropolis became too intrusive. <laughs> in yeah. Only the committee of the Epistates came on regular basis on a regular basis for examination and accounting. Their tales made to the attention, made the attention of the Athenians, of the Athenian public, grow more and more over the years. The next, this um, that changed. Then the statue, without head, helmet, lance, and shield, was put on the wooden. Uh, the next, uh, put on the uh, uh, on a wooden chute and transported up the old path of the Acropolis. The path had to be uh, broadened, evened, and reinforced in many places. There was a small gate in the remains of the old Mycenaean wall up there that later disappeared underneath the building of the new wall. The next, when the transport had reached the plateau of the sanctuary, the, uh, now, uh, the now completely flat ramp led a few remaining meters to the basis on which the statue was supposed to stand. A special emphasis was put on stable assembly due to the wind pressure. In the middle of the circle, a square opening shows where a thick beam was fixed that played an important role in securing the statue. This is also why the head had to be transported separately. The opening of the throat was necessary for the fitting. Like works like the soldering of the head, the shield, the spear, and the attributes in the right hand of the goddess followed. It was only in its full expressiveness after the last grading of the surface which highlighted the goddess sheen on the Bronx, that Pedias uh, presented the statue to the amazed citizenship. The workshop on the southern slope was cleaned, the waste was filled into the pits, and the wooden buildings disappeared. The workshop area itself was, uh, <laughs> was provided by the administration of the sanctuary for the production of other temple offerings over the sanctuaries, which is why it remains clear of buildings of any kind, a fact that astonished um, Pausania's description already. The effect of the nine meter high statue, uh, the next, uh, yeah. um, the effect of the nine meter high statue on its two meter high circle must have been immense. The armament with helmet, lance, and shield showed the feistiness of the goddess. The stance with one leg slightly forward expressed the readiness to move, advance, 
and to intervene on attack. In addition, there was a suggestive impression of the ace made of glass and gems and the aegis, uh, a hide, a hide embroidered with snakes and the frightening, frightening face of the Gorgo. Moreover, as a hint of the banishment of the Persian fools, fools the, the, they held an aflaston in her right hand, I think so, pointed to Salamis. This was an attribute in the form of a ship stern that the observe, observers could identify as the symbol of a victory at sea. Over centuries, this image was present for every visitor who entered the Acropolis and evoked pride or respect. The last picture. I, I thank you very much for uh, your attention. And uh, I'm sorry that it was not so uh, perfect in the beginning, uh, but the new technology and old men, it's a combination which is uh, sometimes a bit uh, difficult. And you see in the last two pictures, 50 years um, of working for the uh, broadcasting, um, uh, broadcasting workshops and uh, only Carol Matos has more. She has 50 years. She is, uh, she is the queen of the uh, things. Okay, I thank you.